Okay, uh, welcome everybody to another West Talk session. Um, Carl, do you want to proceed with the slides? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, by now, you all know that um, the West Talk series is brought to you by both IC Impacts and the UBC Future Waters Group. Uh, just a small intro, um, IC Impacts stands for uh, India Canada Center for Innovation, multi Multidisciplinary Partnerships to Accelerate Community Transformation and Sustainability. And it's been working since 2012, um, since its inception, uh, working hand in hand with communities in both Canada and India to develop community-based solutions for the most urgent needs in both nations, including water research. And the UBC Future Waters Group was formed recently uh, as a collaboration for interdisciplinary research uh, at the intersection of law, policy, and governance, and the applied and biophysical sciences. The current West Talks organizing committee, as you can see, is comprised of five of us. Uh, three of us are from UBC, um, Fuhar Dixit, who is actually the current co-chair of the IC Impact Student Engagement Committee. Carl Zimmerman, who is the BCWWA and West Committee Chair, um, and myself, Abhishek Datta. And we also have Jaskran Diman from uh, all the way from Montreal, uh, who is a postdoctorate at McGill University and also a past chair of the IC Impact Student, Student Engagement Committee. And finally, we also have Feria, who's been amazing at communicating with all of you uh, with the link to the call and also updating you with the list of speakers. And she's the IC Impacts event coordinator. We actually started off the uh, West Talk series uh, about a month ago, no, a couple of months ago. And um, we actually thought we'd stop at the end of the summer, but uh, we have a list of amazing speakers lined up all the way till November and possibly even further. And um, if you have missed any sessions in the previous weeks, we've actually started uploading the recorded sessions from previous um, West Talk series uh, on the IC Impacts YouTube page. There was also a workshop held for uh, people who are looking to apply for federal scholarships, such as the Vanier Scholarship uh, held by Fuhar, Carl, and myself last week. And that's on the IC Impacts YouTube page as well. We'll probably share the link to the IC Impacts YouTube page during the talk. And that uh, we've also had a very diverse um, list of speakers till now, which I'm really happy about. And that brings us to today's speaker, which is Dr. Emil Cornelison from KWL, KWR Water Research Institute. And I'm going to hand it over to Carl for introducing him. Okay, great. Yeah, I think we'll try to share the YouTube link. Um, but if you want any of the past talks, uh, just go on YouTube and search this IC Impacts. And then I just, if you search West Talk, um, all of them come up there. That's just a screenshot. Um, all right, so on to today's speaker, um, Dr. Emil Cornelison. Um, so Professor Emil Cornelison is a senior scientific researcher at KWR Water Institute in the Netherlands and a part-time professor at the Particle and Interfacial Technology Group at the University of Ghent in Belgium. It's a very cool name for a department, by the way. Um, he also works as a visiting scientist at the Singapore Membrane Technology Center um, in Singapore. Uh, he attained his chemical engineering master's in 1992 and his PhD in 97 from the University of Twent in the Netherlands. Am I saying that right? Twente, um, yes. <laughs> perfect. Um, his research topics include membrane fouling and cleaning, rejection of emerging contaminants by pressure and osmotic driven membranes and developing innovative membrane based concepts. And uh, there's a bunch of other cool new membrane based concepts um, that he's working on. Uh, he has published more than 100 papers in well-respected scientific journals, has co-filed five patents, and has written three book chapters, of which I think I've read two. Um, for his <laughs> world-leading efforts, Dr. Cornelison has received several innovation awards in the field of water treatment and, and membrane filtration. So with that, we're going to pass it on. I'll stop sharing my screen right here, and uh, we'll let him okay, take it. you, and I'll uh, try to start sharing mine. I hope I get the right one here. Okay. Let me know. Uh, we're still seeing you. Oh, started sharing screen. Looks good. There we go. Do it? Okay. Right. I'm just exciting this part. Okay. Thank you very much, Carl, for your uh, friendly uh, introduction. And uh, I would like to um, welcome you, you uh, to a uh, presentation. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending where you are. For me, it's uh, afternoon. Uh, and the title of my presentation is Membranes Under Pressure. Uh, and this is uh, a presentation uh, which is based on a preliminary talk I had last year on the Membrane Technology Conference in uh, Toulouse. Uh, and I did some updates for that. But first, I would like to 
with a short introduction of uh, so let's see how to skip it okay huh. sorry yeah it works so um as carl already said i um work at the two different locations basically uh, and uh, also have an affiliation in singapore as an assisting uh, scientist but uh, predominantly i work in the netherlands uh, as indicated by this little tiny uh, spot on the on the map uh, marked at, uh, with the x in the north and uh, in the south as belgium and, and that's the university of Ghent. it's approximately two hours of a drive from one place to the other without traffic jams which is never the case really uh, and uh, well, the benefit of uh, working in two countries is uh, well, in the Netherlands, we are used to wearing clocks, and I can go with them to Belgium and drink some Belgian beers. But to keep things serious, uh, I'll give you a small impression of the buildings that uh, KWR and the University of Ghent are uh, located at. At the left, you see uh, there's a very modern open uh, office building, a lot of opportunity to interact with uh, uh, the KVYR building, which is approximately five years old, and at the right-hand side, more traditional, more classical look uh, of the University of uh, uh, Ghent. So, the activities of the groups that I work, at the left-hand side is KWR, and I dedicate approximately 60% of my time there, so three days a week, and KWR is a uh, research organization predominantly for Dutch drinking water supply companies, but our clients are also uh, includes uh, the industrial clients and water boards. Approximately 180 employees divided over three departments in the department I work in as uh, water systems and uh, technology. And uh, within that group, we have the drinking water treatment. Um, I'm one of the uh, experts on uh, membrane filtration. And the topics uh, that we work uh, on with membranes at uh, KWR are uh, specifically uh, pressure and osmotic driven membranes and focusing on the removal of organic micropollutants, which is uh, an, uh, an, an important theme in the Netherlands and in the Netherlands uh, altogether. Um, some innovative concepts I've been working on uh, in the past are more than this, but the osmotic MBR I'm particularly proud of and also. Uh, the uh, use of periodical air water cooling in spiral wound membrane elements. On the right hand side, uh, some uh, figures on Ghent University, uh, two days in the week. Uh, Ghent University is ranked 61st uh, on the Shanghai uh, Ranking Index. And it's relatively a large uh, university, has uh, 44,000 students, 9,000 staff. Uh, divided over 11 faculties and I work uh, there at the Faculty of Bioengineering in the Particle and Interface of Technology Group, Paint. And approximately 40 people uh, work there, staff and uh, approximately half are PhD students. The membrane topics we deal are similar as uh, the topics I indicated uh, that we work at uh, KWR. But also we include more specifically electrically driven membranes like uh, electrodialysis and reverse electrodialysis processes. Also a, more, a little bit more focus on industrial uh, uh, drinking water treatment and uh, an, an, a topic that's uh, um, quite popular these days is uh, resource recovery and especially looking into technologies for that. Well, membranes and why membranes? Well, membranes are important. And if you look at the total operational capacity of this information plant, as publication by Bill Jones at all, uh, that um, desalination worldwide constitutes up to a staggering amount of 100 million cubes per day. And of that number, uh, there is um, like approximately 70% is done by reverse osmosis membranes. If you add um, electrodialysis and the manifolds filtration to it, then you will see that three quarters of our water is desalinated through membranes. And if you break that down to the type of feed water, uh, which are fed to these membranes, you see that most of it is seawater, while also a, a, a huge amount is brackish water, rich water, and, and upcoming is also waste water. So membranes are important. Why? Well, if you look at 
and I zoom in on pressurized membranes versus Moses membranes, you see that they have a lot of benefits. They are a robust barrier for multiple purposes. Specifically, uh, a reverse osmosis can uh, retain pathogens, so we can disinfect with them. We retain uh, uh, bacteria and viruses. But as I indicated in the previous slide, it's also used for the rejection of salts, so this is for desalination. But also, um, uh, specifically, bivalent ions can be removed and then we can uh, use them for softening purposes, like removal of calcium and magnesium. And uh, it is a solid barrier for most of the organic micropollutants. And I will tell you later a little bit more about this. In the Netherlands, we don't use um, chlorine um, uh, for our um, uh, distribution mains. Uh, and we have to find other ways to uh, come up with biological stable uh, uh, water. One of the ways to do it is treat. Most of the, the water we treat is groundwater and surface water in the Netherlands and Belgium uh, by reverse osmosis, creating a very stable permeate water. The last um, uh, um, topic uh, which can be uh, tackled by uh, reverse osmosis uh, membranes are the rejection of particles. And this is a little bit odd, I'd say, because um, reverse osmosis membranes are not designed to uh, particularly remove particles, the membranes are tied enough, that's not a problem, but most of the membranes are uh, uh, existing in spiral bound uh, module design, as you probably will know, and on the right hand side you see a scene of that. And the specific design of this membrane module uh, makes it um, very difficult to filtrate a lot of particles with these membranes. So rejection of particles is very much uh, limited to the module design, not so much by the membranes. Okay, lots of uh, uh, pros, but there are also several challenges, and, and, and this is really refers back to the title of this presentation, uh, Membranes Under Pressure. And if you look at the challenges we're facing with uh, using particularly reverse osmosis membranes, then we'll see membrane fouling being one of the most urgent ones. Membrane fouling is a very complex phenomena which includes a lot of different mechanisms like particle fouling, um, there's biofouling, there's a lot of uh, um, interactions uh, happening with the membrane or with the module. And this is one of the uh, major concerns when using membranes. Another one is uh, concentrated disposal and treatment since membrane treatment, as you know, is a separation process. So you always end up with a uh, uh, part of the stream that's not treated concentrate and you need to dispose of that or further treat it. Also, um, the uh, membrane filtration process is known to be energy, uh, have a high energy consumption. I will uh, look into it uh, uh, later in the presentation. And removal of small organic compounds can be a little bit tricky. And uh, we'll go uh, to that uh, later as well. And as the last topic is a limited credited log removal, which might be counterintuitive, but this is uh, an, uh, uh, one of the problems when we deal with spiral bound membrane elements. But uh, the limited uh, uh, the log removal is um, uh, limited. Okay, the presentation is uh, divided in several uh, uh, topics, and uh, for that. I use the present uh, and the publication uh, that Xu Yang Tang, a colleague at the uh, University uh, in Singapore at the uh, Singapore Membrane Technology Center, and I made two years ago. And um, this plot is, uh, is uh, from that article. And what I did, I just colored them in and grouped them. Uh, on the y axis in the plot, you see the potential for scale up of a, a certain topic, a certain uh, technology. Uh, from uh, being difficult to easy from bottom to top and on the uh, y, uh, x axis you see the scale of development from being a miniature scale to more lab scale to the pilot and even full scale and then you see the different colors the blue being uh, the development of uh, developing new membranes uh, specifically uh, uh, nanotechnology inspired membranes the dark blue being the um, uh, trends of removal of micropollutants from uh, sources for uh, water. New system designs, there's of course a lot to say about that, but I have to limit and I will give some examples. That's the uh, green dot 
uh, in your young pilot skill with uh, an, an, an possible uh, to almost easy scale up uh, potential. And uh, finally, I would conclude with uh, some notes on integrity monitoring, some uh, work that we recently did at the OER. And uh, mind you, I would like to focus on service and groundwater uh, treatment with this uh, process. So, to start with new membranes. You see in this uh, overview plot, that there are uh, lots of them. So there are lots of developments and that's also reflected by the work that's uh, done in, uh, in, in, in the scientific community. And uh, there's a lot to say about that, don't have too much time, but the new developments can focus on uh, developing novel thin film composite structures, very thin uh, top layers, uh, using uh, novel ma materials all together uh, and uh, looking at 2D materials and incorporating uh, nanoparticles and nanotechnology within the structures. Uh, think about uh, small zeolites in the top layer, like the uh, LG uh, nanohydrum membranes or uh, graphene oxide, graphene or uh, carbon nanotubes, aquaprints inside. There's a lot of uh, things going on. Uh, in, the, in the membrane community, making new membranes. Why? Predominantly, uh, it is uh, aimed at developing membranes with a higher permeability. So if you have a higher permeability, the energy that is required for separation is lower. So this tackles one of the challenges that I mentioned before. Um, a bit less um, um, used uh, is looking at better selectivity of the membranes. And uh, I will get to that later. First, let me um, introduce to you an, um, an important uh, plot, is the Robson plot, or I use uh, to call it the AB trade-off correlation, uh, which was inspired by gas separation uh, research. And um, for that, two uh, important parameters are uh, defined, and it's the A factor in red. Uh, that's the water permeability, which is between the water flux and the driving force, which is, uh, uh, this is the pressure applied, uh, uh, corrected for the osmotic pressure. So that's uh, plotted uh, on the x-axis of the, the right-hand side. The higher the A factor, the more uh, uh, you are towards the right-hand side of that plot. The other one is the B factor which is the solute of salt um, um, permeability coefficient. And that's between the solute flux or the salt flux as you like, uh, and the driving force, which is a difference in concentration of the membrane. So if you make a ratio between A and B, you come up with the salt or the solute uh, selectivity. So you see in this plot that uh, if you want to have a higher selective membrane, you want to add, uh, come up at the top end side, of uh, that curve. So if you look at improved membranes, you would like to come up at the right uh, top angle of this plot. So with this in mind, we did some experiments and we did some calculations. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> the uh, assessment of uh, uh, new membranes, and we compare them to state-of-the-art membranes. So in the top uh, side, you see uh, that we uh, looked at LG Nano H2O brackish water membranes and compared them to state-of-the-art Dow FilmTech brackish water 30 membranes. Same we did for the seawater uh, type of membranes. And we also compared aquaprene membranes with tap water 30 FilmTech membranes. They are plotted on the right-hand side in color. The uh, green ones are the state-of-the-art uh, membranes as measured uh, in our laboratory and the red uh, dots are the ones uh, for the uh, nanotechnology inspired membranes. And what you can see is that we found um, uh, in, in, in improvement in um, uh, effectiveness of the seawater membrane of uh, nano HTO. And we didn't see that for the brackish water. We don't exactly know why that is. We, we got a prototype of this membrane. So maybe we should uh, repeat this experiment, but also the aquaporin tap water membrane outperform the state-of-the-art membrane. So most of it looks like news. Uh, what we also did, we did some calculations uh, and for that we used uh, design software which is available by uh, the major membrane suppliers. Uh, Dow FilmTech developed the ROSA 
uh, hydronautics uh, developed the IMS design program and TORE, the TORE design system. And from uh, the database included, you do, can do some calculations and you come up with those uh, selectivity and water permeability data. And that's plotted also in this curve and you can distinguish on the left-hand side uh, seawater membranes as, as cloud on the left hand and the brackish water or low uh, uh, pressure membranes on the right hand side. And you can see that they uh, are even outperforming the ones that we uh, um, um, tested on the laboratory. But let's see, we try to improve the A factor, what a permeability. So we need less energy. But is it completely true? So what if, and, and this information we obtained from a uh, publication from Cohen van Nuggi, uh, and this plot, the right hand side, you see that the permeability is plotted on the x axis, and the, uh, the y axis on the left hand side is inlet pressure for desalination, and on the right y axis is energy demand. For seawater, you have to look at the, 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 the purple, the red curves, and for brackish water, you look at the orange curves. So assume that we are successful in developing a membrane doubling the water permeability. So for seawater that means going from one to two. And for brackish water that means going from three to six square meter per hour per bar. So you can see in this graph that if we double the uh, permeability, the A factor, the benefit we get in energy demand, in inlet pressure that coupled, is only 7% which is very limited. So you, you double 100% increase in the permeability for seawater membranes, only um, um, improves the energy consumption by 7%. And that's because uh, this energy consumption is predominantly caused by the water composition and the salt content, not so much by the membrane itself. It's a little bit different from brackish water or for surface water uh, uh, membranes. Uh, the benefits are high here. We came up for 38, approximately 40 percent. So the conclusion is that the energy saving is limited, but more uh, um, uh, dominant for the uh, brackish water membranes. And there's something else to uh, consider. Again, we're looking at membranes with an increase in improvement of uh, your water permeability. And on the right hand side, and this is a plot uh, developed by uh, colleagues at the Singapore Membrane Technology Center, Kevin Fain and Rong Wang. Uh, if you increase your water permeability on the x axis, you will expect that your water flux um, improves uh, as well. And uh, linearly, that uh, uh, looks at, uh, then you can look at the purple line. Higher the A factor, you obtain a lot of flux. And this is basically what we desire. Unfortunately, if we look at the modules that we apply, the spiral and membrane modules, uh, we have to deal with concentration polarization. And if you look at the formula that I uh, presented before, uh, flux is related to uh, applied pressure minus uh, osmotic pressure, A factor. You see a factor uh, uh, before the osmotic pressure uh, component. It's an exponent of um, uh, water flux over mass transfer coefficient, and that's the concentration polarization factor. And for a typical spiral wound module, uh, you can find the A factor uh, is one to two LMH bar, as we said before, and the K factor, the mass transfer coefficient is 100 LMH. And if we look at the plot again, then the purple line collapses to the blue one, the light blue one. And any gain that you have in your water permeability is leveled off because of concentration polarization. For a typical A, it's plotted on the x axis, as you see by the error in a typical K. Um, even improving dramatically your water permeability, maybe even 10 times, 100 times, does not necessarily lead to high water flux. So, a typical K values in these spiral wound membrane modules cannot exploit the increased A values that we achieve by all these efforts. So new modules should be considered as well that can benefit of this uh, increase in A factor. Right, let's look at uh, performance of uh, 
refers osmosis membranes, looking at the rejection of micropollutants, which is an uh, upcoming uh, problem uh, when using these membranes for the filtration of uh, surface water. So we did some experiments. Uh, this was done at KWR. Um, and, and there's a removal of small organic compounds for a reference uh, a membrane. It's the hydronautic access pipe 2 1. And we look at the left hand side, you see that passage is plotted against uh, molecular weight for a number of compounds. So I will not read them all out. But you can see on the left hand side that neutral apolar compounds uh, are well retained. Passages quite low if you look at the, the, the smallest one being approximately 150 uh, Dalton, quite small. Uh, we have a, only a passage of 8%, which is um, quite good. But if we look at neutral polar compounds and polar uh, compounds um, uh, up to a level of 120 grams per mole, you see a typical S-curve. And the passage is relatively high. That's 25% of passage for uh, one h benzyl triazole. So polarity matters. And not only polarity matters, also charge net matters. And you can see here a different example of a typical Dow film tech tap water membrane. Uh, that was in the Robeson plot on the right hand side. I included this uh, plot to, uh, to remind you. Then we see for different charged um, uh, or trace organic uh, compounds, uh, a different rejection behavior. This time, uh, rejection is plotted um, for uh, the three groups. The negatively charged um, organic micropollutants are in red, positively charged are in green, and the neutral components are in blue. What you can see is that rejection is highest, approximately higher than 90% for charged components, but can be lower, down to 50% rejection only, for uh, neutral components. And mind you, these uh, different groups are also uh, organized by size from left to uh, right, from the smaller ones to the left, larger one to the right. And you can see uh, some kind of an S curve also in the um, uh, blue bars. It was also interesting to compare this membrane with the nanotechnology inspired membrane. And this is my next slide. And you remember that this aquaprene tap water RO membrane outperformed the state of the art one in the Robeson plot. It, uh, it, it was better, it was further up right hand corner. But this is not reflected by the removal of organic micropollutants. So these membranes are typically designed to um, have an improved uh, A factor, but not necessarily an improved selectivity. So that's my next message. New membranes should at least also, but maybe predominantly focus on an improved selectivity, specifically in this case, organic micropollutants. All right. Let's go to a, a, a different uh, section of the presentation, uh, uh, looking at new system designs and hybrid processes, the green dot and the overview plot. And I give you just two examples, which leans back to the challenges as I presented in the beginning. So concentrate disposal. If you look at a typical brackish water or surface water treatment uh, RO plant, the typically recovery uh, is 75 to 85%, depending on the water quality, there's some variation. It's limited, it cannot be higher, and this is uh, due to the presence of calcium magnesium uh, in uh, your uh, feed water, and this leads to scaling, and that limits basically your recovery. So if we know that calcium magnesium is uh, limiting uh, this recovery, the idea was to take them out beforehand. And we can do that with using a cation exchange, a resin, uh, and, uh, which will capture these calcium and magnesium ions before entering our reverse osmosis uh, system. And then, we did some calculations. We calculated that we could come up with uh, recoveries up to 95%. And that's interesting. So we did some experiments on site using real surface waters. Uh, and uh, this was done by a PhD student a couple of years back. Uh, that was also working at KWR. And um, 
we uh, um, uh, well yeah, she uh, came up with the, the, the following plot in which the uh, uh, permeability say the relative one so the relative a uh, factor is uh, plotted in time and you can see different colors but the main message is you get the, the yellow one the yellow curve this is a, a recovery an altogether a recovery of 98 percent you can see that the relative permeability over this time uh, almost, um, three weeks is stable so we came up with a concept that uh, could uh, treat this uh, water on a very high recovery level for uh, well three weeks and we didn't extend it uh, but this is an interesting uh, idea to um, diminish the amount of concentrate from the uh, osmosis plant which is sometimes uh, an, uh, a big challenge another example um, is uh, related to fouling of uh, membrane also a very important topic and we did the last couple of years extensive research on uh, looking at uh, different pretreatment systems and different systems to uh, um, control and mitigate fouling but i present you only one of these uh, results uh, what we did is we studied the two and a half inch spiral wound membranes uh, and uh, we compared them to a spacer free module that we constructed ourselves um, the pretreatment was quite minimal. We only had a 25 uh, uh, micrometer screen, so not a very robust screen. So we did expect, and we did see, and I'll show you uh, soon, uh, some heavy fouling in these elements. And we assessed uh, this fouling in two ways. Uh, we looked at the fouling resistance increase, it's the capacity loss, is coupled to a flux decline. Um, and it's the RF, the, the fouling resistance, and on the other hand, the pressure drop increase, the clogging, it's the clogging of the feed spacer channel from uh, PF to PC. So these are the two basic parameters that we looked at. And I told you we looked at um, spacer-free modules, and this is the module design that we came up with. We uh, built and constructed, we designed and built constructed uh, uh, setup with a flat plate. Uh, uh, without any spaces. There were some, uh, some grooves in there to keep uh, the, um, the membrane uh, not from touching the module wall. Um, but you can see on the right hand side it uh, being in operation, you see air bubbles. We did also some research on periodical air water cleaning, and that's the picture from. I will not go into that today, but you can see it here in operation. So, no spaces. So, comparison. Uh, the results of the comparison is presented here. On the left hand side, the fouling, this is uh, on the y axis, you see the, the fouling resistance uh, plotted against the filtrated volume. Um, that's related to time, of course. On the left hand side, and clogging, that is normalized pressure drop increased uh, at the same kind of filt uh, filtered volume. Um, you can see that the uh, fouling resistance increases. The, the, sorry, the red. The red dots are the spiral wound membrane, and the blue ones are the uh, spacer free um, element that we developed ourselves. You can see in both cases on the left hand side that the filing resistance increase, but the, um, the red dots stop uh, approximately at one and a half uh, uh, cube per uh, square meter of uh, filtrated volume. And the reason for that you can see on the right hand side because at that point the Spiral wound module was um, severely clogged. So we had to stop uh, the experiment by then. But of course, the uh, pressure drop increase in the uh, non spacer one, uh, well, there was no clogging. On the left hand side, we see that the fouling resistance uh, increased uh, still a little bit, but at a certain uh, time, leveled off and remained more or less constant. So it's a message I would say, like, we should maybe look into modules without any feed spaces, because feed spaces are one of the causes of severe foulings in, um, in spiral wound membrane modules. Okay, then I uh, come to the last uh, topic of uh, today, and that is looking at integrity monitoring. I told you in the beginning that the uh, accredited log removal of reverse osmosis membranes uh, is limited. 
So if you look at existing membrane integrity monitors, uh, methods in, in uh, literature and uh, existing in full scale, you can distinguish two different kinds of methods, the indirect methods and the direct methods. And the indirect methods are typically used in practice. They, are, uh, they monitor the intrinsic uh, water quality parameters, uh, for instance, conductivity and TUC before the membrane and after the membrane. And analyzing those uh, figures, you typically come up with a log removal of uh, yeah, approximately two, one and a half to two and a half. And that's quite limited. Um, other methods exist, and they are described in literature. And there's a nice overview by uh, Peter et al. from 2016 on the right hand side. There's an overview picture, um, which use spike markers. So on, on laboratory scale, or relatively small pilot scale, you can dose MH2 fakes into your feed solution, or you can dose nanoparticles or fluorescent dyes in it. And then you uh, measure them before and after the membrane. And you can come up with very high log removal values from three to even seven. Problem with these direct methods by uh, putting something in your water is that are expensive, especially when you would uh, apply them on, uh, on, on full scale. Moreover, moreover, they can also lead to fouling on your membrane, and of course that's not desired. And also, drinking water companies typically don't want us to put all kinds of stuff in their feed water. It's always a risk involved for the, uh, the quality of the drinking water. So there is a need for a method monitoring the viruses which are in the water. And we can apply that technique and also on full scale without using addition of markers or surrogates. So, and then um, we came up with this uh, method uh, using natural viruses. And I'm not a microbiologist, but I tried to explain the steps that we took in um, um, uh, developing this method. First of all, the natural viruses need to be um, isolated. It's just a basic filtration step. And after that, the genome sequence of these viruses has to be revealed, and that's by doing an RNA, RNA and DNA isolation, followed by a next generation sequencing. If you do that, you multiply these uh, RNA DNA strains, and we can uh, um, um, come up with their uh, genome sequence, and we can compare them with existing databases. They are there. But um, what uh, happened is that the ones that we measured in our surface water, in our local available surface water, is that only one, less than 2% of the DNA was recognized in the database. And for RNA, it was slightly higher, but also incredibly low. So we came up with this method to use uh, natural viruses. And uh, they are quite easy to, uh, to detect and to quantify but we don't exactly know which viruses they are. That's the key thing. We don't know they are there, they're abundant, and we can uh, use uh, quantification by qPCR. Um, and they're also very virus specific, but we don't know exactly which virus we do. So what did we do? We uh, used this method, an experimental setup uh, at uh, drinking water uh, in the Netherlands Oasen. Uh, we had a local available surface water called Grecht, and we did an, a circulation experiment using a cooling device with H in uh, uh, elements. Again, hydronomic extra two methods. We used conductivity measurements, indirect method. We dosed MS2 phages. It was a pilot, so we could. It's a direct method, and we used our natural fires method. You can see on the right hand side an overview of the setup. And this is the results that we obtained. On the left-hand side, you see the results from the conductivity measurements, typically for the feed, uh, a few hundred microsiemens per centimeter, and uh, dropped uh, to uh, a couple of, uh, approximately five uh, microsiemens per centimeter, very typical kind of uh, um, uh, rejection for, uh, for uh, conductivity uh, by reverse osmosis membranes. And that leads up to an LRP of approximately two, as I said before. The middle graph, you see the MS2 phages, which were dosed at a concentration of uh, uh, 10 uh, million uh, plate-forming units per milliliters uh, of 
yeah, 10,000 I said already, they were uh, in the influence and was detected in the permeate. So from this, we uh, deduced that this is a log removal of seven. So the log removal value of these spiral one membranes were seven, very high. But what did the uh, uh, natural fibers measurements uh, result in? Um, well, you can see it for yourself, very similar. We had uh, the number of gene copies that we found in the feed water, and the surface water was 10 uh, to the seventh to almost 10 to the eighth um, uh, numbers, gene uh, copy numbers per liter, and we didn't find them back in the Permeate. So very similar results to the MS2 phases. So we'd like to wrap up because I'm already out of time, I'm, uh, I'm afraid. So from the new membranes and micropollutin spider that I discussed, it's important uh, to, to realize the improvement in energy consumption while improving your A-factor is limited. And when you do improve your A-factor, you also need to think about new membranes to uh, control your concentration polarization. Also look at improving selectivity for instance, micropollutants are not only on permeability when you improve membranes. New systems design, uh, some examples were given to be able to decrease your concentrates disposal and to look at a, re a reduction and mitigation of membrane farting when coming up with new membrane uh, modules without spaces. And the integrity monitoring part uh, uh, indicated that there's a new promising method for membrane integrity which can be used also on full scale. We're actually doing that uh, at this very moment. Well, this presentation couldn't be uh, uh, made without uh, my colleagues from uh, KWR, the University of Kent and the Singapore Membrane Technology uh, 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 Group and the drinking water um, uh, company of Owasen, which uh, um, a lot of this uh, research was uh, conducted at and with. And I would like to thank uh, the Dutch and Flemish drinking water companies for their financial support, uh, also including the Dutch Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And uh, uh, well, I'm opening to receive some of the